So we're going to have a candidate tonight, and these are four candidates for position number one. <laughs> um, for Clark County Commission. Um, we have uh, right next to me Brandon Fowler, and then Dave Hensley right next to him, and then, um, and then Todd Gasell next to him, and at the very end, um, Alan Hedlund. So this is this nonpartisan race. So um, you know, it's kind of good and kind of bad. I think it's, I think it's uh, it could be both. So at least we have a good choice of the folks we have, and not uh, completely one side and completely the other. So we'll, we'll uh, go ahead and um, start out with uh, everybody gave, giving us giving a slight introduction of themselves, and uh, it doesn't have to be real long, but just uh, you know a little bit. Of, uh, a little bit of uh, what you do for a living, what uh, what kind of experience you have, and why you want to serve. Me. So we'll start with uh, start with Brad. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for being here tonight. My name is Brandon Fowler. Um, no, many of you here. I live uh, here in the Chilliwack area with my wife Anna and our three kids. Uh, my wife and I have lived here for uh, a little over about 20 years, and we've served uh, in this community well over that time frame. Uh, Currently a member of the Board of Directors for Children of Fire and Rescue here in this community. Served on that board a couple of different times in a couple of different capacities for a number of years. Um, real proud of the service that my family and I give to this community. And it's, it's been uh, very rewarding and we've, we've certainly had our challenges the last few years. The uh, professional experience for 25 years, I've been a leader and an executive in the telecommunications industry. Uh, companies like AT&T and Verizon and have served in a number of capacities along that line. So um, I have a lot of professional experience as well as a lot of volunteer experience locally around public safety. Uh, it's been my pleasure to, uh, to do that and to serve in those capacities. And real proud of, uh, real proud of this community. This community's been through some challenges in recent years and this community always steps up and, and does well. So pleased to be here. Thank you. So good evening, and I want to say thanks to uh, Visions and Progress for putting this together tonight. I think it's really special for people to come together and learn a little bit about the candidates and make a well-educated decision as to who you want fighting for you and representing you and your, your interests. So thank you for that. Uh, my name is Dave Hensley. Um, I'm married to my amazing, lovely wife, Benji, that's sitting in the front row. We've been married almost 29 years, and we've raised three daughters, which are all adults now, and we're very proud of that. Benji and I live just outside of Merrill, and we own and operate 5-H cattle company, and we find great pride in our rural way of life, um, and we find a great sense of pride in developing our brand into a symbol of trust and respect in our community amongst our, our neighbors. I was a dedicated and committed public servant for 28 years. I served as a police officer. The last six years of my career, I was the chief of police for the city of Klamath Falls. As the chief of police, I was responsible for developing vision, setting policy, uh, motivating and inspiring and empowering staff of about 50 people um, to be successful and, and provide a service to a community based upon our, our community's needs and desires. I was responsible as well for not only managing a budget of multi-million dollars, but actually writing that budget line by line and staying within the parameters of those budgets without excessive taxpayer uh, burdens to you. I'm very proud of that. As a chief of police, I served as a district representative for the Oregon Association of Chiefs of Police. I was the co-chair of the Law Enforcement Executive Leadership Institute in Oregon, and I was and still am on the board of directors for the Oregon Accreditation Alliance, which uh, reviews and analyzes police departments to ensure that they comply with the best practices of policing in Oregon and Alaska. I'm a graduate of Oregon State University, so go Beavs. I always have to say that. Some people like it, some don't, but I'm extremely proud of that. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Political Science. I also think that's kind of funny that I have a BS in Politics. I'm a graduate of the prestigious FBI National Academy where I studied Executive Law Enforcement in Quantico, Virginia for three months. And I'm a graduate of the Oregon Executive Development Institute. So why am I running for Climate County Commissioner? I think that's an amazing question. Um, I don't need another career. I don't need another job. We are very successful on our ranch, but I'm a dedicated and committed public servant. I love serving people. It's been what I've done my entire adult life, and I'm looking to use my education, my experience, my training, and my knowledge 
to, at, at the commissioner level to continue to serve you. So this race isn't about me, this race is all about you, and I'd love to be your champion in Salem, right here at home and in D.C. to continue our way of life. So thank you and God bless you. Thanks, Todd. Or thanks, uh, Dave. Um, so, Todd, you're next. I'm running on a theme, So Klamath Rises. I'm Todd Gessley, and I'm a fiscal conservative, constitutionalist, a husband and a father. My wife is uh, Gianni in the back, running one of the cameras. We have a 15-year-old son that goes to Klamath uh, KU, um, Klamath Union. I'm the owner of Totally Inspired Media. Uh, it's a video production company, and I've worked in 42 countries around the world on assignment for clients. Um, I was educated in Southern Oregon at Milo Adventist Academy, where I met Gianni, and she grew up in Tumalo, Oregon, so she was up there by Ben. Um, our, I've, I've been an Oregonian for 42 years, and uh, just absolutely love Oregon. Um, I have 21 years of nonprofit leadership, and nine years as a CEO and entrepreneur. I love, diver I love diversity, uh, I love people, I hate government corruption, I think the rural areas really matter and have been passed over quite a bit in this huge county that we have. So I'm eager to be here and listen and hear your concerns. Um, I have been an advocate for swift and fair justice, education, health care, and being tough on crime. In this race, I'll be a first-time public servant. I have never served as a public servant before, but having traveled around the world and seen how other governments do it right and wrong, uh, I'm eager to be a part and, and be, a, be a part here locally. I have zero ties to the Basin's uh, good old boy style politics, and it's great to be here tonight. So, Thank you very much for having us here tonight, uh, even though it's a little drizzly out. Uh, my theme has got freedom because I see freedom disappearing all over the world, and I'm sure we have all witnessed that in the last few years. Our freedoms here seem to be disappearing so surely also. Um, graduated from high school, worked on a farm. Got my first driver's license on a John Deere truck tractor, so um, I'm very fond of John Deere's. Um, after that, I went into the military, uh, military family. My dad served and was in Pearl Harbor. Uh, my brother spent two years in Vietnam, and then I enlisted and continued to worry my mother. Um, after that, I got out, uh, took a job at Loma Linda University, thought I'd like nursing. Um, didn't like being inside closed doors, so I went into construction with my father-in-law. There, I stayed there for quite a while until I was, uh, took a job from Universal Studios and worked there for approximately 12 years. And just before that, I met uh, a young man that uh, had just retired from the LAPD and he offered me a job there where I met him. He was my neighbor and I worked in the Sheriff's Department there in San Bernardino County and graduated uh, in 1985 from that. Uh, after that, in 2002, I do believe, one, I met my wife. And somebody, uh, we were in a house and I looked at her and I said, Alan, I said, what? I said, you're in love. I said, oh, stop it. Um, I was working for law firms at the time, and she was one of my clients. So uh, to be an honorable man and to keep from having a conflict of interest in my job and having the attorneys get a hold of me, I resigned and I quit and uh, went into a different line of work, got my contractor's license and worked there until I went into solar for two years, approximately in 2010. So my familiarity with uh, uh, the things that need to be done for uh, cities and counties is very immense. Uh, at the studios, we were faced with multi-million dollar projects, and it was a universal city. Um, it encompassed everything the city would experience. So with that in mind, I came out of retirement after 12 years, because uh, if you don't participate in the problem, you're part of the problem. So after seeing things not progressing and the farmers losing the water battle, 
I definitely decided to get involved when the solar companies wanted to come into town. Thank you very much. Thanks, Al. I think we'll just go ahead and start with questions. We're going to go ahead with questions. I'll try to make focus on the questions that everybody can answer first. And then there may be some specific ones coming down, so I'll see how those. <clears throat> so, this is a good one. It's a very good one. And I guess we can go ahead and start, since we started with Brandon this time, we'll start with Alan this time. Uh, have any of the candidates worked with the tribes? And I'd like to elaborate that a little bit to say any tribes. You know, not just the climate tribes, but any tribe in maybe a different situation, or the climate tribes. So if you can start with Alan and hey, come Have I participated in? Yeah. Worked with. Worked with. Worked with. Worked with the climate tribes or another tribal organization. No, I can't believe I can say that I have participated with any of the local tribes here. Uh, this is my first time in politics, uh, so I'm kind of a stranger to that. My neighbor across the street uh, worked for the Indian Casino over here for a uh, long period of time. I heard no bad things about it. And my mother was a quarter black foot Indian, so um, that's about the length of what I can tell you that uh, I've had in reference with the local Indians here. But with the water problems, we all need to work together. Tom? Uh, I met with uh, Don Gentry, came out and met with the Tribal Council uh, while I've been running for office, and uh, we had a good time together. I told him the white man always talks too fast, and they laughed. And we, anyway, um, I have worked with tribes uh, and original peoples all around the world. Um, and uh, the Bushmen in, in Namibia were being genocided, so I worked with some Romanian missionaries that turned the de desert into wells. Uh, and uh, they put in wells, and then they made it into, we're teaching them how to farm. And uh, so that was, that was fun. I worked with the Maasai up in Kenya on um, their issues of female genital mutilation and saving their young ladies from that horrible practice, um, and then also up in Ethiopia as well. So, um, yeah, I've worked with original peoples many times. One of my near, dear friends is a tribal member um, <clears throat> for the Siletz tribe, and he and his wife, my wife and I, raise our children, so our children were brought up understanding that culture very well, and so that's something that we're very fond of and proud of, and they call him Uncle Jeff, so I'm very proud of that. When I moved here as the chief of police, I established a community police advisory team, and we asked Don Gentry to sit on that team to be an advisor to me. Um, so he had a chair at the table every time we had a meeting, and I was proud of that. Um, as a police officer, we dealt with people from the tribe countless times, trying to provide them services and, and get them help, whatever that case may be. And I had a direct phone line, phone line to anybody in the tribe to, to provide people with services to get them help, and, and I used that many, many times. Um, I also uh, come up to the powwow and participated in that and watched and, and understood what that meant and what it meant to their, to their culture and, and I, I was uh, extremely impressed. And I came up and met with the tribes just a couple of weeks ago as well at one of the tribal council meetings and talked to, to the tribes and answered some questions and felt like I had a very respectful and honest and open conversation with them and looking forward to working with, with all people uh, moving forward as a Climate County Commissioner just as I did as a police officer for 20 years. Thanks, Steve. So, uh, like I mentioned, I've served on the board here for Chilliquin Fire and Rescue for a number of years, and uh, we work with the tribes fairly regularly. There's a contract that um, we have that um, has been negotiated to, you know, help protect tribal properties. Um, and aside from that, I'm currently, for the last three years, served as Climate County's uh, Emergency Manager and Public Information Officer for the Sheriff's Office. Um, in that capacity, I work hand in hand with the Emergency Manager for the tribe, and we, you know, I'm, Unfortunately, I had to collaborate together on many occasions um, in recent years with fires um, that we've had here in Chilliquin as well as other areas around the county that um, affected a lot of people, including the, the tribal folks. And so um, it's something I do today, it's something I'll do tomorrow, and it's something I've done for 20 years. Thanks, Brandon. Um, next question, we'll go ahead and start with Brandon and go back down that direction. Um, there's kind of a little statement at, at first and then a question at the end. And I, I, want, I want to read the statement because I know whoever wrote this would like to hear that, would like people to hear this. Uh, politicians frequently get a bad rap with people pointing out corruption or other bad decisions. Obviously, okay? But the question is, please define integrity and how you have maintained your integrity through the campaign and will continue the course of the election. Excellent. So I'll take, you know, I guess, 
you know, I'll take the uh, the question that was probably most directed at me anyway. So that's not a problem. Um, I, I, there's been two times where um, Dave and I had a difference of opinion. Um, integrity was questioned. Um, he felt I took something out of context. I didn't. We uh, we talked about it. We addressed it. And I think we moved on. Um, most recently, in the last couple of days, um, Scott Allen, private citizen and a media professional in our community, had put out a video. Um, he called into question a lot of things, and, and a lot of, uh, including one of my opponents, and as well as a city commissioner. Um, it's not something I, I didn't know advance that he was doing, and um, it's not really the type of thing that I that I like. I think it sends a, a message of negative politics that isn't what we're about. And Scott and I talked about that today. Um, that video has since been taken down. Um, I know Scott pretty well. He's, he's, um, he's asking some questions and you know things like that. He made some statements that I think, um, I haven't fact-checked it, but there's folks that think that was um, not accurate. So if that's the case, you know, at the end of the day, Scott's part of my team. I will own it. Um, I will take responsibility for it. But I did not, uh, I didn't directly have anything to do with it, but at the end of the day, like I said, um, he's part of my team, and so all of that, um, integrity to me means taking responsibility when, you know, something you do doesn't go right. It also means, you know, taking, taking the hit when somebody else, you know, that is affiliated with you says something that maybe you don't agree with that doesn't come out right. So with that, um, I think I'll stop. Thanks, man. <clears throat> July 1st of 1993, I stood before my parents, my wife, a judge, citizens, and God, and I raised my right hand and I took an oath. I took an oath to protect and serve my community and mankind, and that oath means a lot to me. To this very day, I still carry a badge in my pocket, which is a retired police, police chief badge. <clears throat> so that's extremely important to me. The one thing that will kill a law enforcement career is a lack of integrity and a lack, and a lack of trust and if a police officer lies. If those things, they, if, if one of those three things happen, that police officer is done. And I successfully navigated my way through and, and survived a law enforcement career of 28 years because I always took the high road, I always did what was right, I was always honest with people, and no one ever questioned my integrity. I lived my life by three core principles, and I want to, I want to share those with you. Number one, value people. Number two, find strength in your differences. And number three, be accountable to other people. I've lived my life like that and I will continue to do so. I hold my chin up high every night when I go to bed because integrity means everything to me. If you want to know something about me, ask me. I will always tell you the truth and I will always call it like it is. That's how my parents raised me, that's how my wife and I raised my children, and that's how I'll be your county commissioner. Integrity um, in journalism means letting people know and doing it and fact-checking it so you're not getting wrong information out. So that's, uh, that's been my experience is, is try to tell the truth, get the facts out, not opinion. So much of the headlines today are just clickbait. Um, and I, that's one of the reasons I'm not serving currently as a journalist because you know I don't want to work for somebody that has an agenda. And uh, integrity in this campaign for me means not taking money from anybody to run and represent you. And that's why I'm here today. I swore in 1973 when I entered the service to protect and serve the people of the United States. And nothing changed when I swore when I graduated from the Sheriff's Academy in 85, where I also swore to uphold and protect the Constitution of the United States of America. Um, I will continue to do that to this day. And integrity ranks the highest. And since I obviously uh, am in charge and I am the team, uh, I don't think there's anything that I can say that I've done yet uh, that, have crossed those, that has crossed those lines. And if I have, I will be the first one to speak forth and take responsibility, as I would if I was your commissioner and uh, with the ability that I have to avoid the liability and the pitfalls, uh, I would definitely keep that in mind. And also, there's always bad apples in every bucket. And sometimes we have to pluck those out. And it's our job to take them out and keep the apples crisp. Thank you.
Thanks, Alan. Um, next question, and we'll start. We'll just keep going, Alan, and come back, come back now. Okay. <clears throat> kind of keep that, keep that uh, rhythm there. Um, what would you do as commissioner? And this is for everybody, of course, too. What would you, what would you do as commissioner if faced with the federal or state government trying to implement blatantly unconstitutional actions? Uh, for example, gun confiscation. If there was all of a sudden the state said we're confiscating all guns in Clinton County, what would you do as a commissioner? Well, I would not uphold, uphold any laws that were against the Constitution of the United States and work with the sheriff, which we would both be elected officials and should work together to protect the Constitution and our people from undue process. Okay, Todd. Absolutely, you have to stand by the Constitution. You got to pick your battles and pick your fights, and that sounds like a really good one. Hang on to your guns, because people that lose their guns lose their freedom. I see this question as kind of twofold. Number one, how are you going to kick back against uh, you know these these mandates coming down from Kate Brown or whoever the governor might be? And I also see it as a Second Amendment issue. So let's let, let me split those up just briefly. Number one, if we're getting mandates that are not constitutional, we're not going to do them. I think that's ridiculous, and we're going to push back against mandates that are unconstitutional. It just makes absolutely no sense to me at all. Um, one of the things I said is I want to be your champion to fight for you. That's what we're talking about, local control. Let's do what's right for Klamath County for a change. The Constitution is about we the people, right? We get to have a say, but we don't have a say right now. So let's, let's reverse that. Let's put the voice of the people back in government. The second part, I kind of see it as a Second Amendment um, issue. Listen, I carried a gun on my hip for 28 years, and I still have one today. I think every law-abiding citizen should have guns. So I'm totally pro-Second Amendment. I will never, ever comply with anything that tries to, to limit um, access to, to law-abiding citizens having weapons. Thanks, Greg. So we've had this kind of question come up a couple of times in a few forums. And in general speaking, I think we all tend to agree for the most part. Um, the Second Amendment it is paramount. Um, I'm, life NRA member myself and have owned guns for many, many years. Um, in terms of local control, like Dave said, you know, we, we, we've all kind of said that a, a time or two, I think. But um, the main thing we need to continue to push back on Salem and Washington, make sure that, you know, we're doing what's in the best interest of the people of Klamath County. Okay, it's, you know, making decisions from Salem, making decisions from Washington um, that affects people they have never seen or don't understand. Um, doesn't work, and we've seen that it doesn't work. Thanks, Brandon. Okay, here's another one. Like I said, keep going that direction. For Brandon, how do you feel about solar? This is for everybody here too. How do you feel about solar farms taking over good farmland? Can you find a good balance between farming and solar? So, it, yeah, it seems like this is a thing that's come up once or twice as well, um, and it's it's an important issue. Um, from a from a farming standpoint, I think you know. Agricultural land should be left for agriculture. Um, at the end of the day, I think there's you know some questions as to private property rights, and if a private property owner wants to do something with their land, they should be able to to an extent. But I think there's also reasonable um, restrictions to be put on farmland um, for that reason. Klamath County, 6,100 square miles. Um, there's a lot of land in this county that's not really fit for farming, but would be certainly. Um, more prudent to be used for solar and things of that nature. So um, I think we have enough land to be able to balance those two things. And, um, you know, there's been some challenges in the past with that, but I think it's it's something that we, we have to continue to work towards. Thanks, Brandon. Okay. So Brandon mentioned the rights of private property owners, and I think that's very important, and I'm glad he brought that up. He's right about that. There, there's a balancing act that needs to take place. My wife and I, like I said, we own 5-H cattle company, and we have EFU land, exclusive farm use land. And that's really important to me, obviously. Um, we own that, and, and we haven't been able to farm it. Hopefully, uh, maybe a question about water will come up in a minute. We can address that. Um, but I'm very pro-farmer, and I want to do everything that we can to really protect exclusive farm use land. So there's, there needs to be a balancing act because property owners do have a right to do, do what they want with their land. So I would be in favor of looking maybe at tighter restrictions on what's allowable and what's not. When I said it's a balancing act, the other piece to that is we also need to consider how much the, the county is going to obtain in franchise fees from the building of those solar. 
of the solar facilities and, and what is that money going to be used for and how will that benefit our county? Is it going to help education? Is it going to help with our roads? Is it going to help with more deputies? What is that going to do and what's that going to look like and what's the greater good? So the balancing act really needs to be a greater good balancing act between the, 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 the property interests of the owner, protecting EFU land, and what's it going to look like in franchise fees, and what's our revenue um, going to look like, and what's that going to be used for. So I would be interested, though, in a pause button, some tighter restrictions, and making sure that we're doing what the people want us to do um, when it comes to uh, solar and adding solar. County Planning Commission has been working on this issue for about three years trying to figure out how to best help plan because what happens is big corporations come in here and they can if they conquer and they offer one guy you know forty thousand for his piece of land and eighty over here or whatever they can they can work us against each other so if we really want to win at this thing we need to have a have a plan the current plan right now is is twofold um, if you want to put a solar farm in on your land as an owner you need to talk to the fish and wildlife folks and get kind of a, an approval plan from them. Uh, make sure it's not in the near migration zone and some of those things. Uh, and then also talk to your local irrigation district and get a plan. So once you have those two plans or kind of recommendations from them, then you can approach the county planning commission. Now, if your solar farm is larger than 1,300 acres, the state of Oregon can put it inside it. If it's under 1,300 acres, from what I understand, um, it's a county uh, decision on where it gets placed. So um, I, and as far as, uh, as far as what the benefit for the county is, I would like to see that if we are siding them in, the planning commission at least make sure there's a bond there to clean them up 25 years from now when they need to come down. So, and a lot of the ones that have gone in right now don't have any cleanup, it's just put them in and nobody's thinking about the future. So we need to think about the future. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Alan? Yes, um, after working for two years with the Fuller Solar Farms in Southern California in the Mojave Desert and brokering approximately 12 deals with multi-billion dollar corporations to help ward off the destruction of the farmland and the property and to do the least amount of damage to the underground water tables and to the people's land values. It was a joint venture. At first, they didn't want to. They came in with all types of money. Uh, into the actual uh, commissioners and the planning commissions. Multi, about a half a billion dollars from it is what was at their fingertips. Um, money can buy, but it can't buy the people because um, if you, power in numbers. And so we stuck together as town councils and we brokered our deals to do the least amount of damage to benefit everyone that it could and today, you can drive for approximately 35 minutes, and all you see is solar panels as far as the eye can see. But we were faced with either seven bio fuel plants, windmills, or solar. And so we, we sought out to go solar, but in a controlled environment. And as he spoke bonds, we made sure bonds were issued to protect the, the state of the land. So if they were not to redo, renew the lease, then the soil could then be restored to its original surrounding. Um, I noticed something on the way home today, and it kind of struck me as another source of the bond. I saw a panel stacking up the Pete and Melinda solar out in Derry. Now, does the bond cover the destruction of the hazardous material? that is being piled up in the solar farms as we speak. Um, there's a lot of questions. The Planning Commission has been working on it. Uh, I've been trying to stay on top of this uh, with Mr. Gobel out there, Pat and some of the other farmers out in uh, the pasture lands, because once ground is covered with a solar panel, I can almost guarantee you, you will never ever see a crop growing on that piece of property again. And the first thing they did in our valley they starved them of water, and so they pressured them into getting rid of their land. We stopped them the first time, but the second time they came in with even more money and more pressure. And so we had to find a way to make it doable. And it wasn't accepted, but it did the least amount of damage. We got substations for uh, fire, also sheriffs, 
we were able to get them to put some money up because the amount of money they, uh, the, the first one they took, took a half a billion dollars of taxpayer money. They sold it for $1.7 billion. This is how large these solar sites are, the amount of money that's involved. So the amount of money that can be supplied to our groups of people in these areas, in our county, is beyond your wildest dreams. And we need to take and harness that money and use it to help develop our communities in the way they should be. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot, Alan. Uh, this question will be for you again, Alan, and then we'll come right back. So, uh, now I'm not sure about these figures. These figures are from the, the gentleman or the lady who put the question in. So I'm just gonna read them, and if it's somewhere in reality, hopefully it is. So, uh, I think it is. Uh, all, the county received um, 13.2 million for COVID recovery funds in the American Rescue Plan. It, just, uh, it distributed 4.2 million uh, last fall. What are, what are you going to do with the other 9.1 or 9.2 million left? Well, I'm not savvy to these numbers. Um, I don't quite know how to respond to it, but uh, I know there is a lot of COVID money that's come in. And as far as where it goes, uh, I couldn't tell you, but I do have the same questions as, uh, as you do, as where this COVID money is going. Has it been here? Yes, I've seen numbers. Um, I can't quote you the exact numbers, but it's pretty crazy what I've heard some of the nurses tell me at the hospital. If you go in, uh, how much money they make on you per day. So it's definitely a money-making manufacturing as people go in the door, every time someone gets tested positive. So. Where they're going? That's a good question. No, and I wouldn't form a bunch of committees to find out. I'd find out myself for you as your commissioner. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Todd? Well, like I say, I'm running for office. I'm not in office. I haven't seen the budgets uh, and these numbers. I don't know. I can't speak to them. So, um, but yeah, we'll need to find out and uh, fighting government corruption and looking, chasing the following the money is what I like to do. Plymouth County's received uh, $6.6 million from the American Recovery Plan. There's another $6.6 .6 million that the county can receive for a total of the 13.2, I think was that number that you said. That's where that comes from. Currently, $9.5 million of that has been earmarked and allocated, which leaves, what if, do map in my head, $3.2 million, I think, is what's, what is potentially left of that. I don't know what the, the current county commissioners have spent that 9.5 million on. I have some ideas, but I don't know the total amount. I've heard different projects, but I don't know if those projects total up to that 9.5 million that's been allocated. So if I'm elected Klamath County Commissioner, the first thing I need to do is fully educate myself on where did the money go? Was it spent in a wise, fiscally responsible manner? And what was our return on investment on that money? So if we shelled out 9.5 million, what good did it do us? And then analyze that. And then that remainder of the 3.2, I think we need to reach out to the community and ask the community what they want us to do with that $3.2 million and make sure that we're doing something that, that benefits the community um, as a whole. As long as we can also prove that in some way that does benefit us, there's gotta be some analysis of, of that as well. So 6.6 .6 we have, 6.6 .6 we can still get for the 13.2. 9.5 is allocated, 3.2 is left, um, and I'd like to figure out what you guys want to have happen with that money and make sure that we comply with the regulations of the federal government at the same time, but do something that's going to benefit Klamath County uh, for, for the long term. Thanks, Dave. Brandon? So I, I believe Dave's numbers are correct, and, and one of the things, there's a, a long list of things that some of that money's been earmarked for and spent on. Um, some of those I'm, I'm aware of, some of those, like I said, it's in the yeah. details that I haven't studied too deeply, but um, it's gone to some community groups. I know there's been some focus on housing and, and some of the challenges that we have with that. So um, I know there's some effort to try and address that, which is good. Um, at the end of the day, I believe there's 3.2, you know, in that ballpark. Okay, thank you. Um, three, three and a half, you know, um, the, needs to be you know needs to be spent but I, I i agree we need to get some answers as to where everything is and make sure that we're publishing a full accounting of what those projects are and what what they go for and and then i think we need to make sure that the 
be out to outline areas or making sure that they're getting a, a big, you know, a good portion of that money because I think because I think that uh, sorry I bumped the button. <laughs> I, I get to talking with my hands sometimes and I get to knocking things around. Yeah. Anyway, the um, I, I think we need to make sure that you know some of that money is getting into projects in the outlying areas because there's definitely a lot of effort, a lot of things that need to be done out here. There's some things that haven't been addressed for many, many years all around this county in some of the outlying areas. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah. Uh, this next question, well, we'll you know, like I said, keep the keep the flow going. Um, can you be unbiased about water issues? Sure. I don't. Um, I. My wife and I own 120 acres here in the Chilquin area, and none of it has a water rate. So um, I, I, don't, I haven't lost what I don't have. So, um, but it, to that, I, you know, I think I'm biased about water issues. I, our, I, you know, Dave and, and his wife own a cattle ranch, and, and they produce they produce food. Um, I think you know, and he's talked a number of times about you know the water right and the struggles they've had with not getting water. Um, I think. People need to understand that the, the agricultural community um, has been devastated by you know the drought and by the lack of water and, and by some mismanagement I think of, of water as a whole. It's a finite resource and it's one that I don't it doesn't matter which side of this issue you're on, there's not enough water for any of them. So um, at the end of the day I think we need to have some constructive dialogue, we need to bring people to the table, and we have to have some good, honest discussion and communication about where we're at, where we're going, and how can we all work together to, to make the best of what finite resource we have. Thanks, Brandon. Dave? I'm glad a water question came up. I, I, like, this, uh, I like this question a lot. Um, we've got water contracts and we haven't received any water. What that, what that forced my wife and I to do was really take a hard look at our business model so that way we stayed successful. We've had our company since 2017. We've owned the, our, our current place for the last three years. Um, so we've had to do some tweaking to make sure that we stayed in the black and we weren't, we weren't just buried in debt. To, to date, I'm really proud to tell you that my wife and I don't even have an operating loan for our ranch. We've been extremely successful, so we've had to shift around some priorities to make sure that we continue to raise cattle and produce food um, without having water on our farmland. The question is, can you be unbiased? I think that is an awesome, awesome question. The reason that we, ha we don't have a solution is because there's too much bias. We've all got to be unbiased, and we've got to understand each other. I talked about one of my core principles is finding strength in your differences. We've got to belly up to the table, and we have to talk. Our community has got to talk to find a solution that benefits people. People are going to have to give. Some people are going to have to take. But we're going to have to find a happy medium where we can live together happily and successfully. Um, the agricultural community puts millions of dollars into our economy. We can't let that die. That has, we have to sustain that. Um, but I also highly understand and, and respect um, how the, how the, uh, the tribe feels about the sacred, their sacred fish. I get it. I, I completely understand that. So we have to be unbiased so we can have some honest and real conversations with each other to find a solution. And the reason we don't today is because there's too much bias. We've got to get over that. We've got to belly up to the table, shake hands, listen to each other, and find strength in our differences. Thanks, Dave. Tom? Along with the bias, there's probably just too many organizations that have something to say about water. Um, the way this is structured, really the county commissioners don't have much say in what happens with water. We get it on the economic end of things because it affects all of us and it's the foremost thing on our mind. But to be honest with you, it's, it's the Oregon State and uh, Bureau of Reclamation, the Kid Project, and, and uh, California, the tribes, and the federal government. And they have their agreements, their adjudications, and it's complicated. Uh, since I've been here, I've tried to talk with all the different organizations. I've asked for the treaties. I've looked for trying to figure out what really is going on with the tent and everything back and forth. But, uh, at the end of the day, it is complicated. And the one thing that's lacking is communication. And that's communication for who's calling the shots and, and what it is. I think as a, as a county commissioner, I, need to, I would want to increase that communication for what can be done and what is going to happen. Because even with the rural areas, you guys aren't communicated with enough uh, as it currently stands. And if we can improve that in any way, we're making leaps and going forward. Um, with one of the things I've tried to do is, and I've started talking with the sanitary, um, at least down in, Cl in, in Klamath, the sanitary uh, departments, because if we can take the, take all the black water and turn it into type A drinking water, which the technology of, you know is here, we can put it back in and use it for irrigation. Right now, that water is not being used. 
uh, back for farmers. So there's, we got to do smarter things with our water. Thanks, thanks Todd. Uh, Alan? Do we have a water problem? Yes. That is the most precious thing in life. Every living organism depends on it. Uh, but yet we fight over it. Uh, I propose to go back to the 19. <laughs> thank you, John. The 1906 Original Climate River Project uh, that was established, and we've worked with that since. And there are too many entities that have branched off of it. We need to join together um, to create a water system that works for everyone: the Indians, the people. And as that Cl Klamath River project stated, people come first. With us, without us, we can't take care of the rest of it. So definitely domestic use first. It stated irrigation, then fish. Well, I'm sure we can work something out if we work together on it. And then industrial use, hydro, and then other uses. And that's the way the original bill was constructed. And the other problem I have is I don't know how many people voted to keep the dams, but since I've been here for 12 years, I saw that people voted twice, if not three times, to keep the dams. And still they circumvented the will of the people to their own personal interest to be able to destroy the dams. Now, I'm not a rocket scientist by any means, but if you destroy dams, how can you actually let water out to preserve the fish in the rivers during drought seasons? Um, and also, the Kino Dam, it's only 22 feet tall. It was built for that top water layer to be used for the farmers. Only for the farmers. Before that, there was none. And there's a coral reef in front of it also. So migrating fish through a coral reef has been kind of difficult for me to believe that, that they could actually negotiate. Um, but water is definitely a, a, a thing that we need to look into. Uh, and as far as the depth of the lake before the dam was built, um, it's approximately now 40, almost 50 feet, I do believe, 49 something. I could stand to be corrected by a little bit, but um, the lake isn't that deep, and the dam is what keeps it at that depth. Without it, it would be a lot warmer, more algae, and it would be less likely to, to actually sustain life. And they did a study on dredging, and dredging is out of the question because the, um, I don't know what the federal people know about our own dams and our own wildlife. It seems we should know the best in them, but they deemed that it would be an, uh, an ecosystem nightmare if we dredged the lake, and the extra water wouldn't be able to be used anyhow because it would be below the bottom of where the Keno Dam is actually built. So thank you very much. Thanks, Hal. Um, this next question is going to be kind of a two-parter, and we'll start with Al on that side. Um, what do you hope to bring to the Chilliquin community, and will you interact in our community? What, what would I help to bring to this community? To bring to the Chilliquin community, and will you interact actually in Chilliquin? I heard there's a need for law enforcement, and also um, I heard about some of the first solar farms that they built over here. Um, they're anything but uh, the type that would last the time period that would that would need to be uh, for the 25 to 30 year period of time. So oversight on solar in this area, I heard it's some of the first that came in. Uh, I saw how they erected it, and it was anything but something that I could imagine that would last any length of time. Um, I would definitely establish uh, quarterly meetings to find out what the need of the people are here. Or if, it, if it's a month, every month, Every month, I'd let the people decide how many times, within reason, they would like input from the county commissioners or a commissioner or whoever would come down to actually take notes and take it back and discuss it and come back to you with a decision or a direction that we might take to solve your problems. Because unless we come down to you, from what I've seen, uh, you never seem to be able to get in the front door. And I like Danny Boyd's policy, open door. I would continue that policy, absolutely. And if you have medical conditions that would prohibit you from doing that, I will come to you. You don't have to worry about that. 
Thank you. Thanks, Al. Uh, Todd, would you like me to repeat that for you? Since this is a two-part question. Yeah. Um, what What do you hope to bring to the children community, and what and will you interact in our community? We actually come here and interact with us. And what do you hope to bring to the community? Well, I want to bring my physical presence often um, to be with you and listen. Also, I think we need to look at areas of fire mitigation uh, in the area and cleaning up after the fire. And for those of you that experienced that and had a close call or you know lost properties, we need to look at what we can do to get you more help out here. So those are some things that I would do. I would also, um, it, it's about being a part of the community. That's why I'm running. I want to be here. I want to be in Sprague River. I want to be up in Crescent um, and and uh, Bonanza. All those. That's that's. This is my county. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Dave, do you need to repeat? No, I'm good. I'm going to answer it the opposite direction. I'm going to talk about interaction, and then I'm going to talk about bringing, because I think you got to know what you're going to bring from interacting with people. So I'm going to talk about it in reverse. First and foremost, I'm going to be at the powwow this year, because I told the tribes I was going to be there, and, and our friend Jeff's coming, coming down to actually take us again. So we're going to be there. I think that's really a great thing, and everybody should go. It's amazing. Um, I told you that I established the community police advisory team when I was a chief. There was some legality and some policy that I need to further understand if I'm elected to Klamath County Commissioner to find out if I can do that again and in what capacity I can have an advisory team. Um, but we talked about maybe having coffee, you know, coffee with Dave type, type concept. And when I visited with the tribes about that concept, I invited them to, 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 to participate with me as an advisory body to me and they liked that concept. So um, definitely I think that's really important. I think it's, it's important uh, to, to be inclusive. When I was up here talking with tribal council, they said that part of their concerns is they're not included. And when there's decisions being made about things that are gonna be impactful in Chilliquin, they're not invited to be at the table. And I found that to be a little bit shameful. So I wanna make sure that I'm inclusive of the tribes and decisions that directly impact the tribes or, or their community, their, the community as a whole. I think that's really important. And then listen and understand what the community needs because really that's the job of a, of a commissioner. And then bring those things or those resources, those tools, that experience to the table to help your community. I met with the public safety chief when I was here a couple of weeks ago and he and I swapped some numbers so I could make sure that he had resources to, to further his agency, whether it be the FBI or the Oregon Association of Chiefs of Police or whatever he needed. I still have a lot of connections in the law enforcement community, so I made sure that I was a resource to him to help him develop his agency as well. And I think that that's, that's really important. And public safety, obviously, is my wheelhouse. So I'm more interested to know what is it that the, the residents of Chilliquin want when it comes to public safety? What does that look like to you? How, what do you need? Um, I ran the Klamath Falls Police Department based upon the needs and expectations of Klamath Falls. So as a commissioner, I'm going to do the same thing. What do you need from me? How can I help you be successful? And I'm going to fight to bring that for you. Thanks, Dave. So for much of the last 20 years, I've lived in this community. Um, I've worked with uh, the local uh, folks in I, monthly meetings that we already attend with uh, Sheriff Caver. And, you know, Public safety is always a big theme, and uh, I know that I lived here even before I was, um, you know, the county's emergency manager. Um, I, I worked with, with John Rademacher and, and others that have spearheaded those, those meetings for a number of years. Um, when the city council was looking at putting some funding towards trying to improve public safety in town, um, you know, I've, I've worked with Sheriff Caver to try and, you know, we try and find constructive ways to utilize those funds. And, how do we make that work? And um, so I, I've been here, I've, I've lived it, and, and I've helped do this already for the last 20 years. So we're going to continue to try and make improvements there. One area that I think gets, gets forgotten about is the economic development piece. And uh, we've seen a lot of uh, growth, you know, we're starting to see growth in Klamath Falls and some of the er other areas, but that hasn't reached out into many of the outlying areas, including children yet. And so, um, I, I would really like to see improved economic development out here and some additional uh, businesses that helps improve the tax base, it helps improve uh, people's lives out here and maybe make it so that we don't have to make as many trips to town. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks. Um, so, this will be yours again. Okay. Um, what is your position on ballot measure 18-121? If you don't know, I'll be happy to be. So, ballot measure 18-121, I believe, is the uh, forming a committee for studying yeah. the uh, greater Idaho movement. 
Um, the concept as a whole, I, my own personal opinion, I, I plan to support it. I think Salem has failed us in a lot of ways. Um, they've issued mandates that are um, unworkable and, and put our businesses and our, our, our people at risk. And so I'm, I'm generally a supporter of it. Um, it's something I, I've studied long before I was even in my current role. Um, and I, I understand the concept and I understand why people are for it. Um, I know there's some challenges. I know that it's, it's not without you know, some, some risk and there's, there's, some, there's some things with it that um, bring more questions than answers. You know, how, does, you know, how, do, how do we deal with uh, our EMTs and, and our law enforcement officers and our nurses and our doctors that are uh, registered with the state of Oregon and the licenses that they hold and what type of reciprocity is there gonna be? Well, we'll have to wait and see. Um, you know, the, the devil's in the details and we're a long, long way from figuring that piece out. Thanks, Brandon. Okay. So, first and foremost, I, I, I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to see what the community says. So I'm really interested to see how the community votes on this. If it passes, it's going to establish a committee for it to be analyzed and reviewed. It doesn't necessarily mean we're just going to become part of Idaho. So I'm really curious to see how that shakes out in the election coming up. And then um, if, it, if it fails, I'm not going to give it much thought. If it passes, then we're going to need to buckle down and we're going to need to do a lot of research develop the committee, make sure that uh, there, there's focus and direction on that committee, and that it's analyzed in the right way. Brandon brings up some really good arguments that I've also brought up um, in some other forums. I'm concerned about the millions and billions of dollars in, in relicensing um, police officers, teachers, doctors, nurses, lawyers. Uh, so I have a lot of concern with what that looks like. I'm, I'm not convinced Idaho is just going to pay the state of Oregon for all of that to happen. Are the police officers going to have to go to the academy in Boise? We've all been to the academy in Salem, so what's going to happen? Is there going to be a void of law enforcement while we're trying to get recertified? So I have some concerns that I'm sure that the committee would iron all of that out, but I just do have some reservations um, about that. The other piece to that is the state of Oregon owns millions of dollars of assets in Klamath County. And I don't think the state of Oregon is just going to say, Idaho, here's all of our assets, you can have them. And I don't think the state of Idaho is going to say, hey, we're going to pay you billions of dollars to buy your stuff. So I think there's going to be a lot of struggles with that transition. Um, but first and foremost, I'm really interested to see what the people say, and then we go from there. But I do have some reservations, uh, just to be brutally honest with you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Todd? I'm with Dave. Uh, let's see what the people say. It's a vote to study it more, and uh, we'll, see how, we'll see how it works out. Um, Transition will be, be fun. It has to go through Oregon legislature, Idaho legislature, and it has to go through Congress. And Congress hasn't been able to get anything done lately. So am I optimistic? I'm optimistic. But hey, um, you know, there's some things. We'll have a sales tax. Uh, minimum wage will drop quite a bit. Um, so there's some, there's, some, there's some things we need to look at. And also, our concept of what Idaho is, is changing. It's not, I mean, there are so many, uh, you know, folks up there that have moved in that is kind of changing the state to some degree. Um, it, we adding all of us back in may balance some of their issues out, but I don't know how much, you know, what that's actually going to look like in the long run. So just some fun things to think about. Let's see what happens. Thanks, Todd. Oh, Alan? Well, thank you. Well, since I'm your captain for joining Greater Idaho and Climate County, thank you for that question. Um, as far as the question is concerned, uh, this, uh, like Mr. Hensley said, it's uh, an exploratory vote. And anything spoken prematurely of that is definitely out of line. Because that exploratory will most likely take two to three years, um, hopefully not longer, and all these questions will be answered. Uh, so I don't think, um, I don't think a lot of things, but um, that exploratory will take all those questions and put them to rest. So you'll know exactly if there's going to be money taken out of your pocket, if there's going to be money put in, how much, how it's going to affect the state, licenses, and until that exploratory is done, don't listen to anybody that's telling you they know it unless they have actually fact-checked it themselves, which I have done some, I'm not going to elaborate. If you'd like to talk with me afterwards about it, that's fine. But during this platform, I don't think it's the place to talk about that. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Um, okay, again with Alan. Do the commissioners 
have any control over the planning and building departments? Can anything be done to fix the permit process and costs to make them more affordable? Uh, the building permit costs, it, from what I understand, are pretty well set, but uh, I think the commissioner, commissioners could work with them, uh, depending on what the circumstances are, to lower some of them. I heard everything goes up, nothing comes down, uh, just like at the fuel pump. But uh, if that would help uh, the building being created at a faster rate, as far as housing, commercial building, and possibly maybe even getting Costco in here, um, I think that would be a pretty good size advantage to be able to be flu flexible uh, with the rates that the building code charges. Thank you. Okay, so yes, we we do oversee the building uh, building department, right, guys? I mean, that's one of us, one of the twenty six departments that that we or twenty six give or take something, uh, and the different agencies that we oversee. So yes. Um, I'd, I'd be interested in exploring a, a two-tier tier, um, you know, policy where we have, for rural areas, uh, there's this kind of fees for building committee for, for plan, you know, the larger area there is. I've already looked at, um, you know, trying to bring some larger housing developers in, and uh, we don't want to make the same mistakes that Ben did, um, but we should, off, you know, offer some, we don't have enough builders, number one, to build enough housing that we need. So maybe we should offer some tax, some tax, at least on vacant land, some some exemptions uh, while they're while they're building for the, for the property that's in their portfolio. So we'll explore some of those things. So the Klamath County Commissioners are responsible for building and planning. Um, they do supervise, or excuse me, the the directors of um, those departments do um, report to the Klamath County Commissioners. There is a fee schedule, and I know those schedules are reviewed every so often. When I worked for the city of Klamath Falls, we went through our entire fee schedule and reassessed fees and whatnot from A through Z all the way down to getting a police report. So we looked at all those fee schedules to make sure that they were commensurate and, and that um, we got paid back for the expenses from the city. So it, it, we weren't making money on it necessarily, but we were able to, to pay for that process. So I know that there are, is some latitude to review that fee schedule. I don't know how often the commissioners do it. That'd be something that I'd be interested to look at. But there are currently breaks for people that own EFU land, and I fully support that, and we need to make sure that we maintain that. So if you're trying to build a barn, for example, on exclusive farm use land, there's, there isn't permitting that has to be done to do that. So there are some breaks for people that have EFU land, and we need to make sure that we protect that moving forward. So much of what Dave said, the um, commissioners do oversee building and planning. Um, one of the things that I think there's some challenges with on the planning side, the, um, the final orders that come out don't always reflect, um, I think, some of the concerns that some of our emergency services agencies have, have contributed. I know here in Chilliquin, our, our fire chief, Mike Cook, has um, put some information back or sent some response back on some planning issues. Um, as it regards to, uh, or as it relates to driveway construction, um, things like that, because the, the people of you know this community, you know, spend a couple hundred thousand dollars on a fire truck, and, and then somebody puts in a substandard road, uh, and then you bury a half million dollar, or a couple hundred thousand dollar fire truck. That's not a good thing. So I know there's some concerns um, in terms of road construction, and as it relates to planning and building a little bit. I think that needs to be looked at from a fee standpoint. I think you know there's always room to review fees. Are we are we comparable with other counties? Um, what what is it really in relationship to what the um, you know what the economic situation in our county is for the residents, things of that nature? So I think there should be some reviews, and I think there should be some exceptions for hardship and things of that nature as well. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, so here's here's uh, kind of the last question that will be for everybody. This is this should be really fast one. Did you vote in the primary and general elections? Why or why not? Yes. I vote in every election. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely, because if you don't vote, you're part of the problem. Good point, Alan. Thanks, Alan. Um, okay, these next couple questions, I'm not going to throw them out or anything because people have it, took the time to write them, but they're not very positive. So hopefully you guys won't mind all the stuff that isn't too positive. Um, so Brandon, first one will be yours. 
Okay. Uh, as a, the, the English isn't that great, so I'll try to make it as best as I can. Something about as an emergency manager, certification requires 20 credits of some kind in three years, and you have 19. Do you anticipate satisfying that credit in the next six months? Actually, that's not the case. I have all of my FEMA certifications and everything else for, uh, for emergency management. So um, I've satisfied every requirement uh, of the job description. I did that within six months of taking the job. Um, so that's, um, yeah, that's not an issue at all. Great, thank you. Um, and Dave, this one's for you. When you're the Klamath County Police Chief, when the police officers drug tested, when police officers are hired, they are all uh, mandatory drug tested um, to become um, uh, employable. That's part of the process. And then they are drug tested if an issue arises. So if I perceive as the police chief or a supervisor perceives as a chief that there's an issue, somebody shows up to work drunk or under the influence, things like that, then we had some ability to drug and alcohol test. If they were involved in an automobile accident, involved with an officer involved shooting, so anytime there was a situation that we deemed there was a reason to test, or if there was some situation that was a high liability situation, um, that, uh, that testing was done. Okay, there's a second half to this one. Um, and I don't know if, if this is too, you know, if this is confidential information. Sure. Let me know. How did the officer that took the fentanyl from the evidence locker or room go undetected? So I'm gonna start by saying this that officer had a um, he had an abuse problem he had a substance abuse problem and that officer has paid the price he was charged federally i'm going to tell you what's public information we worked closely we started that investigation and we turned it over to a federal agency that concluded that investigation he was charged um, he was arrested and charged in federal court he was convicted in federal court and he has successfully passed his treatment and um, he has an amazing career and he has an amazing family and he's doing very well so that was a horrible situation um, i was deeply embarrassed that that occurred at my agency but the officer is doing extremely well he's not an officer anymore um, he resigned he, he was brought in to be terminated but he resigned in lieu of termination while he was going through that criminal process and uh, but he's doing amazing and I just spoke to him a couple of weeks ago and he gave me a big hug and we worked some things out. And so I, all, I want all of you to know that that man has found God and he's doing tremendous. So give him some grace, please. Thank you, John. But I will answer that question. There was some theft that was occurring and I'm not gonna get into the details about that, but the moment we found out about it, we had security cameras and we were able to witness what was going on and we um, i was the first one to break that to the community i have heard rumors that i covered that up that is the furthest thing from the truth i was the first one to tell the community that happened we put a press release out we put something out on our social media pages and i wrote that and i wrote it myself um, so I, i've never covered anything up i've been honest to, to this community if there's a question you want to know from me ask me i will always tell you the truth and i will always answer it with my chin up high because I led a police department that, that uh, was highly respected. We were accredited. Um, it's a very noble and honorable profession that I'm extremely proud of. There are people that make mistakes in life, and when, when I found out that there was a mistake made, I personally rewrote that policy to ensure it never happened again, and I went to the Oregon Accreditation Alliance about establishing some accreditation policies that require agencies to live up to a different standard to ensure that never happened in Oregon and, and Alaska. Thanks, David. Uh, we've run out, I believe, of our uh, prepared questions, not prepared, but our written questions. So I want to go ahead and open it up to the audience for a little bit, and uh, we'll see how that goes. For Hensley? Hensley, yes, sir. Hensley. Yes, sir. Uh, you said that the county has awarded nine and a half million of yes, that sir. COVID relief money. Correct. But their published recipients only add up to three. Oh, four million. So there's five millions that aren't listed here. I, I don't have your answer. Like I said in my statement, so I don't know where that, that money that's, I said that in my statement. I don't know what they've spent that on. I'd need to do some research on that. Okay, how did you come up with the nine million? Those are numbers I was given from the, from Klamath County Commissioners. To you? Yes. Okay, the, the publish doesn't show that. I, I'm not going to argue with okay. you about it. Okay. I just told you what I was told. <laughs> I made that quite clear. <laughs> uh, also, uh, are you going to, well, 
of the new commissioner going to establish a new board to award that, or are they going to do it themselves? Sir, I don't have that answer. You don't know? Okay. Thanks. Anybody else? What what years were you uh, police chief? 2015 through 2021. I was there six years. Okay. Prior to that, I was in the city of Corvallis for 22 years, and I worked my way up to uh, the rank of captain there, and I applied for the chief job here as a captain in Corvallis. Mr. Rick, police chief, uh, what, how, when you look at the police force, uh, was that on your own free will, or were you asked to resign, or did you resign on your own? I retired. I did almost 28 years in law enforcement, and I retired after a successful career. So in, in Oregon, you can retire at the age of 50 after 25 years of service, and I did almost 28, 27 years in 10 months, and then I retired. When I was hired here, I told everybody I was going to retire at the age of 50 at 28 years, and I stepped in my work. So you were not involved or there when the, apparently the other police chief uh, was uh, let go or terminated for uh, falsifying police documents? I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never heard of a police chief from Klamath Falls being terminated. Oh, well, I guess uh, Herald News must have it wrong then. Uh, Mr. Fowler. What article are you referring to? Because there's no been... about the Klamath Falls Police Department. Yeah, I, I don't know what you're referring to. There has never been a chief fired from I think he a, uh, there's, there's a sheriff that uh, had there, some issues. Yeah, there was a sheriff maybe that had an issue, but not yeah. not my agency. Okay, the sheriff's fired. I think. Okay. Don't yeah, don't quote me either. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Fowler, uh, yes, you said you had 120 acres. Is that like Fire District 3 and uh, it, River? It's out, it, most of it's out River Road by near Fire Station 3. So you live out by uh, Evan, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I thought so. Uh, could you tell us uh, what agency or what group or what crew that you hired to clean up all that property uh, during the fire? So it wasn't during the fire. We did um, some cleanup around our property last February. I hired a company out of Bonanza Sutherland. Uh, Matt Sutherland, I think is his name, uh, from a, a logging company that helped, uh, helped us do some cleanup out there. Okay, so they weren't compensated by the state or the county? No, not at all. Not at all. It was, you know, we, we sold some timber that was on our property um, to reduce our fire risk and our fire danger. Okay, I'll have to check on that a little bit further. Uh, I could have got some misinformation on that. Uh, do you know anything about the uh, the hotel and the other properties on Highway 97, just where you had Klamath Falls, it was bought by the last set of commissioners that was in office? Uh, I, I two I'm, per, I, I'm familiar with it from the from a peripheral standpoint. It was Project Homefront um, that was funding that came from well, the state. Well, explain to us uh, why there were people in there that were actually paying gas. Uh, they were all thrown out. They paid $1.9 million for that. I knew the people that owned it before. I could have bought it for 485000 But they got spent $1.9 million. But anyway, uh, and then they went in and spent $460,000, $500,000 for new roof and everything. The place is empty. Do you have any idea what they're going to do with that? Because I understood that they bought that for the fire vectors. No, it wasn't entirely for fire victims. And what, I, was I, wasn't, what was it for? I wasn't involved in the decision making on that. So those rooms are available for uh, transitional housing for parole and probation folks. Well, there's nobody there. Uh, well, there are people there. There are some people there. No, those are state vehicles. No. Two of them were. Okay. I, I won't argue with you, sir. Um, uh -huh. I'm, I'm aware of, I, yes, I'm aware of the project. I didn't have any hand in the decision well, the reason making. I'm, the reason I'm asking you this. There, there are a couple of rooms to answer your one of your points about it, though. There are a couple of rooms set aside for fire victims, should should that have been no, necessary. I'm sure this hotel had a lot of room in the back for campers and all that. They're all gone. But anyway, we know the state's in the real estate business. But the two uh, two uh, elected officials, a county commissioners, were deadly opposed to that body but they got inched out by the rest of them. So it seemed to me like the state's in the business of buying real estate and just sitting on it and going in, you know, taking the, you know, the appreciation on it down the road because none of them, 
uh, they're kicking them out of the hotels. I own Happy Tales Campground next to Collier. Mm -hmm. Ground Zero, that's where it all started. Yep. That's the fourth fire we had. I, me and my sons put out the other three. I've talked to you several times on yep. the phone. No, I remember you. I know. I know. You're the one that forgot to do all the paperwork for FEMA. I mentioned, oh, no. Not no, at all. Well, that's what FEMA told me. Well, okay. I, we, we, did, we did all of the paperwork for FEMA and, and the you individuals. The you individual. Yes, I did. I have no record. I have documents to prove that. Well, let's be a little civil here. That's all right. Give me a chance to answer. I'm civil. I'm civil. I'm 74 years old and I got a little hearing problem, so I'm talking too loud. Might see them brace and accosted, but I'm not. So I'm just asking questions. So uh, let me give me a chance to answer you. Um, we, we submitted all of the paperwork for FEMA. Um, the fire victims that were eligible. Then I'll have to get on okay. FEMA. I'll have to get on there for that. The fire victims that were eligible got individual assistance for FEMA. We well, jumped through, F, we jumped through every hoop that, that we were jumping through. Uh, Forest Service for six years on them to get to clean that up back there. It either wasn't in the budget or they didn't have manpower loading for it. We put out three fires on our own. Mm -hmm. uh, the one, one of the uh, firefighters that sits on your board, you set out his, but he sits on your board as Mike Cook over there. Mm -hmm. They sent a bunch of trucks out, a bunch of kids, uh, with no water in the trucks. Our place is totally true. destroyed. It's burnt to the ground, everything. A whole lifetime. But anyway, that's not the point. I've been trying to work with FEMA, I've been trying to work with DHS, tried to work with you. Mm -hmm. But half the time you didn't answer your phone, the other half of the time you didn't have no answers, and now you want to run for commissioner? you got to be kidding me. Sir, I, I, I've talked to you many times. Okay? Yes, you and, have. And, and I will tell you that... Um, you dodged me the other half of the time. That's not true. Because you don't have the answers. That's not true. Well, that's just my opinion. Uh, there's several other questions. I wish this was open mic, you know, because I'd love to get up there. I'd discuss Say what you want, sir. I Say what you want, sir. Mike, right Might as well. Well, I need an open mic where I can get up to my bother you. Yeah. Why? Because I'm hitting home somewhere. No, I have no, no saying that. Just I mean, go ahead and ask your question. Just yeah. ask yeah. a question. Mike's right there. Then let someone else ask the question. Or does she want to ask a question? I, yeah. I do have a question about how familiar are the four of you in the last effort to um, have a, an agreement with the water issue? Because we had the tribes, we had the, you know, we had everybody in agreement, but then when it went to Congress, uh, it never even got, came up. So I was just wondering if you're familiar with that because we need to know the history of that, in other words, in, in able to go forward with the water issue. So I, if that's, I don't know if that's directed at all for of us, but I'll, I'll take is. a, okay, I'll take a stab at it. But, um, I'm familiar with the agreement conceptually. I, I don't remember each and every detail of it. It was a few years ago. Um, and you're right, it died in Congress. Um, for me, I would like to see us at least start from there and figure out if, if that can be the framework for an agreement that, um, that we can work with and then work with our elected officials in Salem and Washington you know, to make sure that we can get something done. Um, if, if that's the framework that works for, for everybody, um, I think generally we've all agreed that you know, we need to get together and we need to uh, bring people to the table and we, we need to figure this out, but it has to be done locally. So that agreement was originally started by a man named Greg Addington. I don't know if you guys know Greg or not. He's a he's a hell of a guy. Oh, I'm sorry. Hope the hell doesn't bother you. So I've known Greg for a long, long time, and he's he's a great man, and he's actually endorsed my campaign for Klamath County Commissioner, and, and he supported me tremendously. So I know quite a bit about that agreement. I've looked into that agreement. Here's what I find most um, encouraging. That all started with a handshake and, hey, let's go have a cup of coffee. I think it was actually a beer, but let's just go talk and let's, let's see if we can't eat something out. Um, and, and he was able to accomplish that. So I think that if there's a will, there's a way, and if there's a past, then we have a, a road moving forward. So I'd be really interested to sit down with Greg again and say, hey, how do we try to do this again? My concern, though, is a Democratic, is, is the Democrats in the, in the, in the, uh, 
in Washington, D.C. I think that's going to be our uphill battle is Washington, D.C. again. I think locally we can come to a conclusion, we can come to a resolution that we all can agree on, but I think until we get some different um, ideas and um, some people in Washington start to value the climate basin a little bit differently, I think that we're going to have an uphill battle. But I think it's a fight worth fighting, and I think that uh, since we've done it in the past, we can certainly do it again. We just need to get to the table, talk to each other, come up with an agreement, figure out what it's going to look like, and fight together in D.C. to make it work. I've been here for a year, and I'm not familiar with, I've read about the agreement, but I, beyond that, I don't know what's in it. But I'll come to speak. Colin, do you have anything to say? I guess I'd like to add something to that, if you don't mind. Um, Congress, yes, they seem to have failed us. Um, Democrat, Republican, it's been going on for years and years and years, as we all know. And I got tired of it. And so I came out of retirement. Because I've been on that side of this table before, and I've heard this over and over and over again, year after year. And all I can say is, why do I keep hearing the same thing? Obviously, somebody is not doing their job. So I ask you to give me two years to try to figure this out and put it together for you so I can give you answers or make it work. And if I can't do it in two years, you can get somebody else to replace me. How's that? <laughs> Thank you all. Any other questions? More and more. Uh, for the three of you, except for Todd. Uh, I don't think he was involved in this. But uh, what are you gentlemen going to do about the fire victims from the September 7th, 242 fire? All of these things have not been addressed. See, uh, the reason I ask this is, ODOT comes out and says they're going to take all of their trees down off the highway because they were a danger. They cut them all down, left a big mess, and drove off. They went down to a sanctioned Oregon State wetlands area and destroyed them. Left all the logs and all the brush piled up. I said, you can't do that because you're in a wetland area. Oh, well, we, can't, we can't come in and clean that up. Uh, that's a designated wetland area. You don't have to do that yourself. They come in with bulldozers, tore up the property, move soil. Oh, that's on you. That's not on FEMA or the state. So you commissioners, it's going to be in this county, with the exception of Todd, what she wants to answer. What are you going to do about us that are left? Been fighting this for the last two years and got nowhere. So I'll, I'll start with that to say that you're not the only one that's been fighting that. ODOT's not lived up to the agreement. They've not done all of the things that they were asked to do. Um, they're not, they've not done all the things they signed up to do when the governor gave them that responsibility. Who, I, I agree with what you. What was that again? You said ODOT's done everything? Right. No, they have not done They have not. They have not done it. They have not done everything that they were tasked with doing. Okay. So, Mr. And, and, Mr. And Mr. We're, Mr. Maybe Commissioner, what are you going to do about it? We're going to, you know, I'm going to continue to try and hold ODOT's feet to the fire. Okay, I'm going to continue to work with our state partners and try and bring some accountability to it so that we can get that done because it's not acceptable the way it's been done to this point. Uh, no, it's not because we went through all of our insurance money. I went through, I'm 74 years old, I went through all my retirement funds and, I, and I'm still getting beat down. You know what, because it's two years old. Hey, you know what, let's go on to some other crisis right now. We don't want to deal with that. They come in and ruin the property. They show up with water trucks with no water in them. And say, so you got the A-team here, we're going to take care of this. Well, I'll tell you what, I was the last one out, everybody else had evacuated. I, my, everything I owned burnt down, my jacket was on fire in the back of my head. But I managed to go out and steal the cat that had walked off and left to take it across the street and save the property and all the horses and animals across the street. I could save that. And I was running the show, not those idiots. Now, you're going to be sitting up there in a pretty good sized chair that controls Clown County. Is this going to be just a good old boy network again like it has been? Or are you actually going to get up there and allow some cages and get something done? I'll go next. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have to drink water. You're at your best shot, brother. <laughs> 
<laughs> so here's one of the comments that I've been making to a lot of people, and I'm going to tell you, I, I'm not running for this position to get reelected. I didn't ask for my No, listen, listen, listen I'm going to answer, I'm gonna answer your question. When you're in there. You asked a question, now I'm going to answer it. I will okay? Sure. So when I, when I say that, here's what I'm talking about. A lot of people run for positions because they want a career, they want, they want this, they want that, or once they get into those positions, they don't make hard decisions because they feel like they want to get reelected moving down the line. This is a two-year term. I want to make some things happen. Let's get in, let's shake some things up, and let's see what we can do. And if I'm successful and you guys like what I'm doing, great, let's talk about re-election. If you don't, I'm going to move on. That, that's, that's where I'm at right now. But here to answer your question, here, here's what I'm going to say to you. I'm sorry you lived through that. I've never had to live through something that you lived through like that. I, I've never been a victim of fire. I've never looked like hell raining down on my place. So you know, listen, I'm going to answer a question. Simple thing. Listen. I live for Reddit Dare, Kuwait. We put out 731. Well, I'm sorry you lived through that, but here's what I'm getting at. It, you ask what I'm going to do? We're going to have a town hall meeting, if I'm elected, and we're going to listen to all the victims. And we're going to figure out what those concerns are, and we're going to make it personal. And we're going to have ODOT here. And we're going to have ODOT decision makers here, and they're going to hear what you had to live through. And we're going to make it personal, and we're going to hold their feet to the fire. I thought that was a great pun, pun intended. And we're going to try to figure out how we can resolve some of your issues. But we don't do it if we don't talk. And it, we don't do it if we don't fight for what's best for Klamath County. And we don't do it if we're too concerned about getting reelected. Well, you know what, that's, that's the whole world here. Apparently, uh, that hasn't been done up until now, because you're going to rectify that if you're elected. Uh, so that's a real weight off of me. But you know, I've been through all these agencies, and all they do is keep hiring a bunch of 25, 30 year old kids to keep passing the buck around, and it's been from one agency to the next agency. This has been two years. It took us seven months to put out 731 old fires <coughs> day and tonight. We got it done. We don't mess around. Right. Never did. But this is just some gothic horror story that just keeps unraveling and unraveling. And they spent all these millions of dollars that was funded under the Stafford Act from FEMA. And I, what did I get? Uh, a, a news blog from Josephine in Jackson County. Oh, we got just a bunch of secondary in, in, in money. And you know what? We're going to put our thinking caps on and see how we can beautify the city and do this and do that. And where this money would be best spent? It didn't go to the victims for which the money was allocated. It went to pet projects and bull crap. But you're going to change that. I'm going to have to think about you because I, I don't know about you yet. If you do get elected, you can count on me blowing up your phone every day. <laughs> Just keep Brandon's note. I, I was going to say, I'll give you Dave's number. <laughs> Do you have anything to say? Yeah. See, I'm not that bad of a man. You know, they just got, see, you know, I am like most people. They don't want to address no higher issues because uh, it's, you know, too, uh, it's too upsetting. Not me. I fucked right up to them. You got my number. I got your number, and right now you've got my ear. All right. But I'm going to be real disappointed in you, son, if you go up there and act like the rest of them. Absolutely. Don't plan on it. Alan, do you have to say? Yes. More transparency, absolutely, all the way around so you know where all the money goes. Every last cent. Full accountability uh, for all the taxpayer money. And, um, not to knock FEMA. FEMA does a lot of good work. Too much, too little, too slow. And I think we've seen this all the way around America. And by the time the buck stops to help us, it's either depleted, gone, or we're gone. Um, after going over to Medford and talking to several individuals about, they're still burned out and they still have no money that was promised to them by the government because they were put on a waiting list. This was, came firsthand to me and I went, a waiting list, oh yes. Um, there's other people in front of us. So I can I can believe in waiting lists, but at the same time, during wartime we had such a thing as it's called triage. And so you get the worst got treated quickest and the rest, um, well we got to you. But at the same time, the time wait and the period that you have to wait is way too long. 
They, there needs to be less government, less agencies involved, and a streamline of the money. Now, if that can be accomplished in the two years, if I'm elected, I'll do my best to accomplish that. And if I can't, I'll tell you why it can't be done. And by the way, in the four years I worked for attorneys, there's one thing I learned. There's no such thing as no, can't, won't, or I don't know how. Get it done. Thank you. Thanks, Mel. Do you have a question? question or I'll just shut up. Or a statement. <coughs> you know, I, for the last two years, I've been working with uh, uh, Fred Gerard, uh, East Ninth District uh, State Senator from Oregon. Uh, he thought they had bipartisanship in an audit of where this money went. But he seemed to slide on that a little bit uh, when it went back for a vote. But he's getting close, and I'm right on top of it. And I'm, if, if, if I die in a month or two, if I can get the answer to that, an audit on where this money went, I'm going to let everybody know in Klamath County. Because I'm going to tell you what, that's been the whole problem here. It's all went for these pet projects. It's all went for beautifying fire departments that were totally functional. I mean, they're no good if you don't put water in them when you got out. But the new building and all this uh, room additions and all this kind of stuff we're spending money on, none of it went to us. None of it did. And I'm also working with FOIA, Freedom of Information Act. You guys would really be surprised at the information I've already got. I had to take that all the way to a federal judge in Portland. But you know what? It's coming into me by the piles. I'm going to find out where this money went. And I'll guarantee these people in here are going to be really surprised whether they do anything about it or not. They're going to be surprised where it went. So I'm taking notes. I'm stepping up to the plate. We're glad you're here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That's it. I'm done. You know where I stand. <laughs> I got my eye on you. <laughs> Anybody have any other questions? I got just one real quick statement. Absolutely. Go ahead. Whichever one of you guys winds up being a county commissioner, what one thing you need to realize is our water issue in the upper basin is completely different than the lower basin. That's correct. We are cut off from water. We have been for three years now. And the there's a the war is uh, bigger than people want to admit. The lower basin doesn't want us to take water out of the river because that's less water in the lake and less water for them potentially. So this community of Chiloquin, the ag community up here is gonna go dead real soon unless some solution is found. So when you get there, just realize this is a whole other entity up here. Yeah, and I think that's important for you to remember as well that you guys need to be at the table. You need to have a voice and be an active participant in trying to come up with an agreement because you're 100% you're right. We all farm and, and ranch differently across this basin and we can't, we can't forget about our, our, uh, our neighbors and our partners. And one size doesn't fit all. Um, if your domestic wells are going dry, uh, talk to the water master. There are funds available to drill your wells deeper. Well, I'm great. It seems to be every meeting we've gone to, there are water problems north, south, east, west of Klamath County. Um, there doesn't seem to be a simple solution, but uh, talking to Tom Mellons, his situation is different than other people's. And talking to Ken and Connie, 12 Ranch Wines, Sherry, Ray, um, all the people out in the Leango Valley, different problem out there. Everybody has a water, everyone has a water problem, and yes, since I've been through my name in the hat for this, I can't believe how convoluted and how, uh, how many people's fingers are in the water problem. Not that it's not needed, but at the same time, I found by bringing people together uh, over on that, that side where I live, they're already be, becoming able to work things out and the solar is becoming clearer and slightly better to be able to accommodate that. As even Mr. Dave Goble came out of the last commissioner, or, um, planning commission meeting saying, 
wow, that's a lot, a lot better than it was in January. And I said, yes, become proactive, go to meetings and have input. And this is why, if as your commissioner, I would make it a point to reach out to each and every community to bring people together because there's power in numbers to divide as a conquer. And so we have to stick together to conquer these things and to make them acceptable so we can continue ranching and living and for our grandchildren and their children thereafter. We don't want this to stop. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Um, let's go ahead and have some closing statements. And we'll start with Brandon and go down the line. Unless anybody has just some dire questions they have to ask. Okay, well, one comment before you start, Brandon. Just one comment. Have you guys ever been to Four Mile Lake? Yeah. yeah. Four Mile Lake up in the up in the Cascades. Do you know where all that water goes? It goes to Medford. Medford. It goes to Medford. It's it's on this side of the Cascades. It should be going into our water system, not theirs. By the way, just my one thing. But anyway, go ahead. Well, thanks again for everybody being here tonight. I appreciate uh, Chelquin Visions of Progress for putting this event on, along with uh, uh, our friends from the city and, and the support that we've had. Uh, for the last 20 years, like I've said tonight, uh, I've served this community. Um, I've served 25 years in the private sector before I've served the last three as your county emergency manager. I, and I, we love this community. We've owned property here a number of years, and so it's been, it's been a pleasure to to work with many of you throughout the years and, and continue to serve you regardless of you know where, where the next uh, you know couple of weeks land but it, uh, it's been a pleasure and we're gonna we'll, we'll keep serving in, in any capacity and keep helping this community thank you thanks man Dave? my great-grandparents moved to Klamath Falls in the 1920s my grandmother was born here my mother was born here I was raised uh, outside Eagle Point in Sam's Valley was not raised in Klamath Falls, but uh, we're close friends with Charlie Livestock and they had a cattle ranch on Clover Creek Road, which is still today where I run cattle, so I'm quite familiar with Klamath Falls. Here's the point I'm getting at. Fast forward 22 years, I'm sitting at work one day in Corvallis, I'm the captain with the police department, and I get a flyer for the city of Klamath Falls police chief. And I went home that day and I said, Benji, what do you think about Klamath Falls? And she goes, I love Klamath Falls. And I said, I do too. Let's go for this. Through that process, there was a lot of prayer, there was a lot of family meetings, there was a lot of discussion. Before we uprooted two of our children that were still in high school, we wanted to make sure that we were following God's path and we were following the path that was right for us and our family. And it felt right. I got the job, our house sold real easy, we bought a house real easy. It felt right and we knew we were walking down the right path. Now let's fast forward again. I've retired as the police chief and I've had a very successful career. I worked almost 28 years, I wasn't fired, there was no drama, I left on my own terms. People ask me, why are you retiring? And I said, I'm going to retire before you want me to. I'm going to leave when I'm on top, not when I'm at the bottom, kicking and screaming and you're shoving me out the door. I'm going to go when I think our department is in a really good spot and our community is in a really good spot. And I'm extremely proud of my career. I wouldn't change a thing about my career. We spent a lot of time praying and talking about if I should run for Klamath County Commissioner. And it feels right. As I've been going and meeting people and talking with people, and people have been endorsing my campaign and supporting us, I know we're on the right path. I know my servant heart will be best served as a Klamath County Commissioner. I think my training, my education, and my experience will serve well as a Klamath County Commissioner. But if you forget everything I say tonight, I'd encourage you to remember one thing. This job is not about me. I've been a dedicated, committed, passionate public servant to people for 28 years. And I'd love to be passionate and committed to you again as your commissioner for the next two. So God bless you. Thank you for coming out. If I've earned your trust and respect, I ask for your vote. And if I have not, shame on me. Maybe I'll do better next time. But God bless you. Thank you. Have a great night. Be safe getting home. I'm Dave Hensley. Thanks, Dave. Todd? What makes me different? Well, I'm not coming out of retirement. I want to get to know you. I've been a journalist. And I think really what matters is communication. That's the one thing I've spent my whole life doing is communicating, working with people that are doing nonprofit things, local heroes, and people that really care about their communities. I haven't accepted money from anybody. I just want to represent you and to serve you. I bring international experience, my business background, project management, and journalistic communication skills to the basin. I love diversity, and I hate government corruption. I'm an advocate for 
I don't like seeing the, the, the regular man being beat down by the system. I, I like to get answers and, and move things through quickly. I love education, healthcare, being tough on crime. If you want more of the same, vote how you, you know, vote. Keep voting for other people. Um, thank you very much. I'm Todd Gessley. My website is elect Todd G. Thanks, Todd. Uh, Alan, you're up. Thank you all for coming out here. Appreciate it. And I think we pretty much all stand for the same thing. Um, we want more housing, less crime, economic development. We're all headed in the same direction as far as all these platforms that we've had on. Accomplishing them in different directions in different ways, yes, that's diversity. Um, and the diversity spans in different directions and who can accomplish them the quickest and the most efficient and cost effective. Um, uh, solar is one of my greater assets that I've worked in and trying to uh, keep it from having a great footprint in this community. And there's one problem I have with it when it does come. Well, we're going to sell it to Washington and California and not meet our own core demand dates. I have a problem with that, and that needs to be addressed. Now, are you going to say we're going to keep building solar sites until we can mandate what we're instructed to have? Why can't we keep what we have? And then after that, we'll give away what we have. These are lots of questions that uh, I have. California pretty much has kept most of their solar. Um, uh, under, and I will not let the Constitution be undermined. Every time we turn around and turn the TV on, um, they're passing new laws to undermine it. Um, ghost guns. Every part you buy now will have a serial number on it. So the FBI can keep track of you and what you do with it. So as far as um, gun control, no. We have the constitutional right to bear arms and we have the constitutional right to speak our peace just like you are here. And that's the way it should be and always will be. As I raised my hand during the service and also when I graduated from the academy. Um, I have no special interests. I've been 12 years very quiet. People wonder and ask me why. I said, well, Social Security turned me loose last September, so I'm here. Uh, and I couldn't stand the way things are. And with, if you read my profile, Half my income is going to be going to nonprofit 501c charitable donations uh, with no special interest ties attached to them. If they do, they won't be receiving any of that money. And that is my word to you. Uh, as a disabled vet, uh, I'm a man with honor, and I will be there for you. And as they say in the service, leave no person behind, and I am. 100% that to this day. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, we'll call, call it a wrap. And, uh, thank you.